Whole year has been God shifting us from the mindset of Christianity and religion and church being a location that you visit once a week, throw George in the plate and you go home to the plan that God actually had. And that is that the church is his family. This is his household and that we are his children. When we understand that, then there is a unity that can be formed because God's design is that we're going to move as one. In the scripture, whenever you saw unity being unfolded, you always saw a great, a great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. But what happens and what's happened in the body of Christ at large, as we've seen the church struggle, I mean, let's just be real. The church at large, especially in America, has been in a very deep struggle as the church has been combating, even accepting sins that the Bible clearly talks about. And now ministers are now carrying those sins from behind the pulpit and declaring them to be okay. But I'm here to tell you is that God's kingdom has not changed. That God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I change not. And God's plan for his church has not changed. Oh, I just sense the anointing this morning. His plan has not changed. And in the planning that God has is that even though some will compromise and the, the church will walk away, there will always be a remnant. There will always be a group of people that will be unwilling to compromise God's truth God's truth, God's truth, God's truth. And when you know that, then everything changes because the church you belong to has a direct impact on the vision that you will accomplish. You see, many people go to churches where they'll never fulfill God's will for their life. How is that possible? Because the church you go to has a direct link on whether or not you can fulfill the design of heaven. If God has called you to a healing ministry, but you go to a church that doesn't preach healing, then you'll probably not be used in that healing ministry. Why? Well, because the pastor is the head. Listen, the anointing doesn't flow from the feet up. It flows from the head down. Say amen. If you believe in the prophetic, but yet the church doesn't have any prophetic ministry in it, well, then you're not going to ever move in your giftings. Why? Because the anointing flows from the head down, not the feet up. You see, if you're a person that believes in soul winning, but the pastor still has not given a, has not given a salvation message at the end of a service in the last 10 years, I don't know why you're still there. I guess I'm talking to you. You know, this is where we've got to make some decisions in our lives because what's happened is the church has been shaken and the reality of who God is and what God's plan is, is more manifested. And so as the body of Christ, we've got to make sure that we protect the house. Can I hear an amen? Protect the house. Say amen. Protect the house. Say amen. Listen, I know it's hot in here. We turn the heat on. But it takes three days for the heat to get turned off. But I'm not arguing with what's on outside because I was able to ride my Harley to church this morning. Amen. So I'm good with the heat. Just keep waving. Hallelujah. I want to talk about protecting the house because if you don't protect something, then it can be easily snatched. You know, as, as, as people of America, we are very interesting people. How many of you live in an apartment, a house, uh, your own abode of some type? I'm just trying to see who's homeless this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> What's amazing is how many people protect their homes. How many of you lock your doors at night? We're trying to find out that person too so we can come visit. We lock our houses. We have regular locks. We have deadbolt locks. Now we have wireless deadbolt locks. We have alarm systems. We have personal protection weapons. Glory to Jesus. All because we want to protect the house, not only our belongings, but the people inside the house. So we believe in making protection. We believe in making sure that what's outside can't get inside to cause damage. But I'm here to show you this morning that the greater damage doesn't usually come from the outside. The greatest threat is rarely from the outside. The greatest threat is usually from the inside. 
And today it's important that we learn how to protect from the inside out, not just the outside in. And we're seeing that I'm not a political pastor, but we're definitely seeing that even in our government where those who are in the armed forces and we honor you, you made a declaration that you would not only protect the, uh, the declaration from outside uh, damage, but also from inside. Because we're watching as America is disintegrating, even under the prophetic guidance of the scripture. We're watching America lose its strength. We're watching America lose its power. We're watching Russia, the uh, Magog and Gog and Magog. We're watching China and Magog starting to work together and the Euphrates River starting to dry up. And the Bible says that the Euphrates River will house the 200 million soldiers that will march down to the Valley of Megiddo. I'm here to tell you today we're watching as the prophetic utterance is unfolding and if there's ever been a time for the church to pay attention of who we are it's right now we cannot let our God down and I'm not talking dead bolt in the front doors because there are a lot of folks who do that a lot of churches it's you me and nobody else but in this house we want everybody to come into the house of God because everybody's somebody to Jesus Jesus loves everybody Jesus has a plan for everybody it doesn't matter where you've been it matters where you're going and God's plan is not up and thwarted if you still got breath in your lungs. Turn to someone and say, I got breath. That means he's not done with you yet. Our verse for the year is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 and it says this, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. One of the greatest things that you got to protect within the church is the culture of the church. The atmosphere of the church. If someone walks into a church and they feel like they're unwanted or undesired, do you actually think they're going to stay? Well, that's big. Because who's supposed to be the one welcoming them? No, Jesus through you. Which ultimately means if somebody comes and they don't feel welcome, then where's Jesus? We've had folks walk in this, in this building that have been the largest drug dealers of Elmira, have been people that everybody has said, I actually had somebody walk up to me one time and say, you won't believe who walked in the doors. And they whispered their name and I said, who are they? But they knew because all of Elmira knew. They were a, they were a, a struggling family. They were a family that had a very bad reputation, but they walked in the house of God. Listen, I believe this. No gossip allowed in the house of God. Can I hear an amen? Gossip is not allowed in the house of God. Why? Because we've got to be able to allow people to walk in these doors who need the Messiah, who need the Savior, who need the blood that can wash away the sins of mankind. And if they walk in here and feel the judgment, then they'll never walk through the front and give their heart to the Messiah. It's time to recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that this is not our church, but this is his church, and that God has a divine purpose, and we've got to protect the atmosphere, the culture of the house. When the church doesn't protect it, then what ends up happening is that everybody comes in with their own theology and their own philosophy. Have you, I can't tell you how many times I've had this. Somebody comes up to me, they, they've come from another church. And they said, well, pastor, I don't like it done that way. I like it done this way. And the thought that immediately runs through my mind is then you should go back where you came from. I don't say that. But that's the initial thought. Listen, if the place you came from was so good, then you should have stayed. But you left because there was something wrong in the culture. There's something wrong in the atmosphere. And you see here, the greatest thing that I believe that is distinct about his Tabernacle Family Church is not just that the pastor is very cute. What makes his tabernacle so unique is you. You love God. Man, I can't tell you how many guests come into this house, how many people that are guest speakers that come to this house, and they simply say this, Pastor, it's one of the easiest churches I've ever preached to. I know that I can just move in the Holy Spirit any way I desire to. I remember when Jim Rayleigh was coming to preach, and when Jim Rayleigh was coming to preach, he asked, uh, he asked his, his young uh, youth minister, and he said, 
How free can I be at this church? And he said, Pastor, you can do whatever God tells you to do. Ah, there's no greater compliment than knowing that this is not our house. This is his house. There's no greater culture than knowing that God's spirit is allowed to move however he desires to move. Why? Because God's kingdom come. His will be done. Not man's will. Not a church's will. But God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, it's time to recognize that we've got to make sure we protect the culture the atmosphere within the house so that the nobody breaks in and tries to say, you know, honestly, though, no one's going to break in here because we're paying attention to that. The issue is when somebody gets here and they have their own agenda and the desire to come in and try, start pushing some toxicity within the atmosphere of the house. You see, that's what we've got to pay attention to. That's what we've got to understand that the enemy's going to do. The old Trojan horse is how the enemy always moves. He comes in and somebody's coming in with a big smile and a great happiness, but they have their own agenda to destroy the work and the will of God. And I want you to know that the culture of the home is determined by the wholeness of the individuals within the place. And those that are struggling with breaking down in their own heart are destructive because hurting people hurt people. And then all of a sudden, now you have a bunch of people that are wounded all over the house. And that's not God's plan. What's interesting is the atmosphere and the culture you can't see. It's, a, it's likened a lot under carbon monoxide. You can't see that gas. But it kills people every year. Where, where it does not have uh, the, the right release of the gas outside of where the people are. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. And, and all of a sudden, now you're, you're getting a little loopy. Then all of a sudden you go to sleep and then you don't wake up again. And how many churches are like that? There's a phenomenal book if you never read it, read it. It's called The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. They did a study on a group of churches that were at one point thousands of people. And they studied these churches and because now all of them are closed. Closed. Some of the buildings are actually bulldozed down and they studied what was the demise of those churches and what was amazing It was never from the outside. It was always from the inside the very toxicity that came from a culture that could not be seen was what was destroying the church from the inside out. I bought this house and, and the, I'm looking at this monster pipe, four inch pipe going all the way from the basement all the way up through the, through the roof. And I'm saying, what in the world is that? And they said, it's for radon. I said, well, I mean, I've heard of radon. Radon is a colorless and odorless gas that occurs naturally and can be quite deadly at high levels. In fact, it's reported that radon exposure contributes to 21,000 lung cancers a year. But if you don't test for it, you never find it. And if you ignore it, it's still there. Let that sit for just a second. Just because you ignore something don't mean it's gone. Just because you try to evade and try to get around somebody that has a bad nature, can I hear an amen, doesn't mean that they've left. Whomever is there is leaving a deposit of some kind. Every one of us are depositors. When you walked in here this morning, you deposited something with somebody. You might have met out in the foyer and you started complaining about uh, the driveway. You started complaining about how hot it is in the church building. You started complaining. Come on now. Well, that offering was kind of long. Well, you know, all they want is the money. Well, you know, I, you know, well, you know, listen, finally be quiet. Why do you think your opinion actually matters anyways? You know, we've got to come to a conclusion that we are releasing deposits and the deposits are gas. And if there's a lot of bad gas, listen, I'm not going there. If there's a lot of radon in the house, thank you, Jesus, a lot of carbon monoxide in the house, then even though you might still be here, you're being infiltrated by death. And as a church, we've got to protect 
the culture. We've got to protect the atmosphere. We've got to protect. Why? Because it should be God. It should be God's nature. It should be God's atmosphere. It should be where God wants to move, how God wants to touch, how God wants to bless, how God wants to convict, how God wants to save, how God wants to heal, how God wants to deliver, how God wants to manifest his love. I don't know about you, but if you come to church and it's just church, then you've missed out. But I want God when I come to the house of the Lord. I want to experience the living God, the resurrected Christ. I want the one who was and is and is to come to touch me, to minister to me, to love me. But he don't go into all atmospheres. The Holy Ghost is a gentleman. Remember one time I was preaching in Long Island. We had a, a, a person healed the night before. That night, that th the next service was that evening, and that that person took off dancing all over the altar. I'm talking dancing, and I guess it wasn't a good dancing church. You know, a lot of white churches they don't like the dancing thing. Just say it the way it is. So all of a sudden they're dancing all over the church, and I hear a man jump up, and he says. The Lord would say, thou shalt move only in the spirit and not in the flesh. And looked at the pastor and said, you're going to take him out or am I? He said, what do you mean? I said, didn't you just feel the Holy Ghost go? Because he's a gentleman. And he only goes to the right atmospheres. And I said, you take him out or I will. He said, I got him. And he went down and rebuked the guy. Told him to sit down. And then I helped when I preached. I simply said, listen now, if you're dancing, you're always in the flesh. Because if you're not in the flesh, that means you got a ghost running around here. Everybody's got a body. And if you're dancing, you got to make your body, got to make your body move. <laughs> I got to get a drink. What really affects the body of Christ is not the said things, but the unsaid things. The unsaid values are what actually create the atmosphere that you're in. For as a man thinks, so he is. So one of the big portions that we've always held from the very beginning in 1998, we're getting ready to celebrate our 25th anniversary. If you've not, listen, there are only 300 seats. If you have yet to sign up for our 25th anniversary celebration in February, you might want to do that quickly because it's going to run out fast. But from the very beginning, the Lord spoke to us that this was a place of grace and mercy. And then he was going to send people to this house that everybody else was going to normally reject because they were, quote unquote, too far gone. But that God would send them here and that he would love them and that he would grow them and they would do great things for his kingdom. And that's exactly what Pastor Ron and I held to all these years. I was at a prophetic conference and a, a, a prophet pulled me aside and he said, you, you speak too intellectual. I have never been accused of that a day in my life. You're too intellectual, pastor. You've got to dumb down the gospel. I said, uh, 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 uh. that old prophet came in behind Ron and I and said, the Lord says your house is a place of grace and mercy. You heard right from God. You see, that demands an atmosphere. That demands that a religious spirit is not allowed to be present. Religious spirits are very real. I know some of you don't believe in demons, but they're real. Believe in them or not, demon spirits are actually real. If you believe there's a God, then you believe there's a devil. If you believe there's a God and you believe there's a devil, then you've got to believe there are demons. And demons have assignments. And the assignments are to dupe, to dupe the people of God into a religious state to where it's me or me only or I am perfect or I am right and I am always doing things right. I'm here to tell you, even if you're right, you can be wrong. But what I found is that where God wants to create his house is a place where you can walk into no matter where you have been from, no matter how bad you were, and that the people of God all remember where they came from. How many came from deep sin in the room? Well, every head should be up. 
because a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. And you might have only, you might have only cussed 10 times, but you're going to the same hell as a Satanist. They might be going a little bit deeper, but you go to the same place. We tried to even categorize the sins. We tried to categorize and see who's worse than somebody else. There's nobody worse than anybody else. Without the blood of Jesus, somebody's not going to heaven. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. Not our religiosity. Not our goodness. It's not by, come on now, it's not by your good works. The only thing that gets you to heaven is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And if you think you've got to clean yourself up to get God, you're really messed up. Because Jesus takes you exactly who, where, where, who and where you are, and he'll grow you and mature you. Man, there are some people in this room today, 10 years ago, when somebody said, oh my goodness, if they looked at your life, they would never have ever thought you'd have been sitting in this service today. I always brag on Chris Van Zyl, which went on a motorcycle ride yesterday. I, I brag on Chris all the time. Why? Because he came from a very bad background. You don't mind me sharing a little bit, Paquito? Alcoholic, like real bad. Real guy, alcoholic guy. He was a biker. His nickname was the Antichrist. He was a bad guy. When he got saved, he came to church and he said, Pastor, anybody bothers you, let me know. I'll take care of him. <laughs> you know, there are people that say that, that, you know, yeah. <laughs> he said, I went, Ooh, I'm not telling him. Someone's going to die. But I've watched as God has taken that man. And when his daughter got sick, I watched his faith. I watched him press into God. I watched him declare the word of the Lord. I watched him stand in faith. I watched him walk the things of Jesus. Is he a perfect man? His wife will say, nay. But he's a man of God. And I respect him because nobody would have ever thought Chris Van Zyl would ever be born again in the house of God. But Jesus has a plan. Jesus got a purpose. God's got it. But you cannot come to a house if the atmosphere ain't right. Can you imagine if he came to this house and the first thing he got was, yeah, I know him. You see, we got to protect we protect our house. We put deadbolts on. We got to put some spiritual deadbolts on. There's things that we're just not going to let in the house. In this house. Say that with me. In this house. Come on now. Say it again. In this house. One more time. In this house. I'm not responsible for anybody else's house. You can't deadbolt somebody else's house. But you can deadbolt your own. You got to deadbolt your own spirit. And you got to deadbolt the house of God that you go to with. Say amen. amen. Why? Because our genuine beliefs are determined on how we live. And by how we live is the health that we portray. You know, when I go to Mexico, I'm going in December. Terry and I are heading down in December. We haven't been down in four years. COVID. Hate COVID. I believe it was diabolical. Going down and... When I start praying for sick folk, I sick folk, I'm always praying. All these folks got diabetes. They all got diabetes. And I, I had to ask, why they all got diabetes? And it's simple. They have real Coca-Cola, not American Coca-Cola. Like they have the Coca-Cola that's sugar cane. And you might as well just spike that beast. They drink Coca-Cola for breakfast. They drink Coca-Cola at 10 a.m., they drink Coca-Cola at lunch, siesta time, and supper time, and then while they're watching their TVs. They're drinking so much Coca-Cola that the sugars are spiking. You see, what you allow in determines the health of your spirit. If you do not allow the Spirit of God to move in your life, then you will be toxic. And you will have diseases in your spirit, man. And you will die. But if you'll be one that will guard the house, and I'm not talking your physical house. I'm not talking your physical body. I'm talking your spiritual man. If you will protect your spiritual man by what is allowed in and what you allow out. I'm telling you today that you can become a healthy soul. You can become a healthy spirit man. You can be somebody that will be an addition instead of a toxic Dis disciple. 
Say amen. amen. You know, when you look at an apple, you look at an apple. This is an apple. But that's really not the apple. The real part of the apple that made the apple is the core. There's always a beginning. The DNA from the tree determines the type of apple you're going to get on the tree. And if you're not connected Christ with Christ in tightness, then you're going to find the latter part of your life is going to be a struggle. And you're going to find you're going to get bitter in the house of God. Say amen or oh my. You've got to make sure you protect the core. God's house should be his value. Say amen. I've got to quickly move. I'm sweating. Thank you. There are certain things in this house that we're unwilling to be allowed to be stolen. Now, some of you, your TV is very important to you. And if somebody came in and stole your television, you'd be really ticked off. But some of you, your TV, you never even turn it on. Some of you, if somebody touches your motorcycle... There could be issues. Some of you, somebody stole your wife. <laughs> Some of you wouldn't care. Some of you would be real issues. You protect what's valuable to you. What you put value in is what you are willing to defend. So we must make sure that what we're defending in our spiritual life is what God's design is because it's his church. The Bible says in Colossians chapter one that Jesus is the head of the church. So Christ is the one that determines the values. Christ is the one that determines the purpose. Christ is the one that determines the direction. Not a person, not a man, not a religion. And so what happens is knowing the heart of God. You see, I want to say this in this house. We must have God's heart. The heart of God is always souls. God always blesses a soul when in church. Person recently left the church and they did it right. They were very kind and they came and they said, Pastor, I have other friends at another church. Is it possible that I should, you know, is it all right if I go there? And I said, sure. I said, you know, I, I don't know. And yeah, I'm, I'm just a shepherd. I said, but the fact is, is this, if they don't give an altar call within one month, you better get your butt home. We had a man leave the church for a woman. And uh, as he's with this lady at another church, he went to a Bible study and uh, at the pastor's house. And he realized that he knew as much about the Holy Spirit that the pastor did. And then after three months, he said to me, I got to come home. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, Pastor, he has not even given an altar call at the church in three months. So he asked the pastor and the pastor said, well, we know everybody here. Oh, baby, that's called sewerage. A stagnant pond. Where there is no new life coming in, you can still have your doors open, but you're already closed. There must be new life. There must be new self. With God's heart, God's passion, he wills that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world to not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We are the body of Christ. We've got to have God's heart. This is not about you and I coming to church and feeling religiously good. Say amen. That fume is toxic. We're coming to the house of God. We're coming to dad's house. We're coming to our father's house. We're coming to Abba's house for a reason. Because God has set a table. He set a banqueting table. And he said, come on now. Don't forsake the assembly of yourself as the matter of some is. Especially in the last days. Why? Because we need each other. We need to worship together. It's called corporate worship. If you're doing a visitation with God, you're doing yourself no favor. Say amen. God's desire is that we're together. Listen now, if you want to be like the book of Acts, the Bible says they went to the temple daily and then met in people's houses all week long. 
Some of you don't got time for God monthly. It says I don't got God's heart. Well, that's not what I mean, but that's what it says. Well, you know, I didn't mean to release carbon monoxide into my home, but that's what you did. I didn't mean to ignore the radon, but that's what you did. We've got all of our justifications, but we've got to have God's heart. And this church has got to keep God's heart. And that is we have always got to have a passion for the lost. We have got to be driven for the lost. When we're starting to listen now, we're going to do some uh, making up of this place and fixing it up a little bit. But you know what? I'll be honest with you. I could care less about this building. The problem is that other people do care. The greatest revival in America that ever happened was the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. And it happened in a horse barn. The pulpit was made out of egg crates. The benches were pieces of wood that were stranded between logs. The evangelist, William Seymour, would get up. He'd kneel down, put his head in the crate and just pray until God poured out his spirit. The fire department was called multiple times because the church was on fire. There was a visible flame coming from from the horse barn. And and they called the fire department. When the fire department got there, it wasn't a natural fire. It was a supernatural fire. People were healed. People were delivered. You see, the building is not the passion. The people are the passion. And that's his heart. When that's lost, then you've lost church. When you only care about yourself, you've lost church. When you only care about you, you've lost God. You are who you hang with. And if you've got no care about anybody but yourself and your little survivalist, then are you actually spending time with the Lord? Probably not. Well, that's judgmental. No, it's not. It's evidence. If I have a bad, if I have bad sap going up through the apple tree and it starts building the apple through the core, the DNA, then the apple is not going to be healthy. It's going to be crotchety and raggedy and it's going to have worms. But we don't equate that to the body of Christ. We just equate that to a tree. Read John 15. He is the vine. We are the branches. The branches that don't produce fruit, he said, cut them off. You see, we as the body of Christ, we just got to make sure that we keep his heart so close to us. The heartbeat of heaven. When you love you more than you love God, you now are God. The problem is you don't got enough to be able to handle being God. The heart of God is that we know him. Knowing God and making God known is his heart. And when the church loses his heart, I just got it. They become in bread. They become an ancestral pool. And then they protect the pool. Then the only things you got now, baby, is frogs. That's the only thing that can survive in that. Then those little spiders that always run across the top. When we get God's heart, then we move like God. Can you imagine if we all had God's heart when we come into the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning and our greatest passion is to worship him? Can you imagine the worship service if everybody wasn't interested in the roast that's cooking? Listen, baby, I'm cooking right now. I'm cooking. I, I'm smoking. I should check that. Do you got my phone? I got to check my ham. I'm, 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 I'm smoking two hams right now. Baby, they're going to be so good when we get home. They're going to be so good. Oh, it's 98 degrees. We're getting close. Can you imagine if your greatest passion when you came to church was anything but Jesus? 
when it's worship time, you don't worship, you just kind of look around? Boy, she got excited. I don't know. It's hot in here. Oh, don't raise your hands. I don't know. You know, I, that pastor, you know, he could dress better. One guy recently came in and says, well, you know, I don't see any crosses in this whole church. Just pictures on the wall. It's all about people. It's all about people. You're an idiot. Sorry, if you're watching, I mean that in love. You're a religious idiot and you need deliverance. Because this is about God and about God's people. It's about loving people. When was the last time you loved somebody and it cost you some inconvenience? I'll, I'll ask that again. When was the last time, I'm not saying you're doing it because they're a buddy. When was the last time you loved somebody and it inconvenienced you and cost you? When you can't remember the date, the year, then you've got to ask yourself a question. Is my mission God's mission? Or is just this me surviving on the planet until the trumpet of God sounds? You're greater than that. Or you wouldn't still be here. We have got to have his heart. And this morning, this is the number one thing that I want to drive home. Actually, it's the only thing I'm going to drive home. If you've ever gone out and gotten deadbolt locks, a new ring doorbell to see who's coming up to your door. There's somebody at the door. I can see them. I want you to see yourself and say, do I really love God and do I really love people? I'll just tell you the truth. The day that leaves this house, so do I. Because as the pastor, if this is about building a religious church, you know I ain't building in Horseheads, New York. I'm going down south. I've already been offered churches of thousands of people. The reason I'm here in New York State, Jesus, with the taxes and the government, the oppression of the government, we live in one of the worst states in the union. That's a fact. That's not, that's not just me saying, that's a fact. The only reason I'm here is because God said, I want you to be in horse heads. You see that field, that corn field, that pot field? At that point, that's what it was. I'm going to give you that pot field. And I want you to build me a house. And I'm going to fill the house. And then he said, that's going to be the youth place. I want to fill it with so many souls, I'm going to have you build another building out front. This is going to be the youth. And I believe we're going to pack this beast. Because the devil ain't going to have our children. The devil ain't going to have our teens. The devil ain't going to have our college-age students. The devil cannot have our moms and our dads. The devil cannot have our grandmas and grandpas. The devil cannot have our region in Jesus' name. The devil cannot have it because the church is greater. The church is more powerful. The church is supernatural. We are God's body on earth. And we shall stand and show forth the glory of heaven on earth. And when that changes, we stop being the church and we start being a religious institution. And I refuse. I pray you refuse. Refuse it for your own house. Refuse it for your own life. Refuse it for your part in this house. That when you come, you'll never be religious.
it's always about Jesus. Amen? Excuse me. Well, thank you. I got a lot of blessings right there. Could I have you bow your heads with me this morning? I got to point number one. If you'd like, I can preach two and three. And four. I have four. They're not going to get close this morning. But to me, this is the one. Do you really love God? Do you really love his people? Remember, the only thing you can take to heaven with you is somebody else. When was the last time you led someone to Jesus? When was the last time your life was a direct impact on somebody going to heaven? And if it's been a long time, baby, come on now, come on now, come on now. One plants, one waters, but God brings the increase. But if you're never planting, you're never watering, then the seed stays in the ground. In your seats, there are my top five. And I pray that you've already picked it up and written down five names that you're believing God to see saved by Christmas. But today, if you're in the room and you don't know God, today, if you're watching online right now and you don't know God, you don't have God's heart, but you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. He's calling you. How do I know? How do you know when it's God? Because you get that, that uncomfortable feeling. Is it me as a God? 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 If you're asking that question, it's usually God. And then if you're far from God and you don't even have a desire, I'm praying for you. You're in a scary spot. You're in a scary spot if you're not right with God and you don't feel any conviction at all. That's a scary spot. And today, if you're not right with the Lord and you want to get right with God, you know there's a sin between you and heaven. You know if you take your last breath, you, you, you know you're not going with him. Come on, man. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your season. Don't let it pass. This is what God's house is for. No one's better than anybody else in this room. We all come the same way, the cross. We all have to bow our knees and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Today, if you're not right with the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to get right with God, this is your day of decision. You are making a decision whether it's right with the Lord or not right with the Lord. You're still making a decision. This is the day of decision. Today, if you'd like to make a decision to serve God the rest of your life, to make God your number one priority, to say, Lord, I want your heart. I'd like you to slide your hand up this morning. I want to pray with you. Is there anyone in the room this morning that needs to get right with the Lord? Don't take long. Get your hand up. Five. Come on, get your hand up. Four. Come on, get your hand up. Three, two, oh, come on now. I know you're here. Last call, and one. By the way, you can't join this church even if you want to. We don't have a membership. The only thing you can get here is called part of the household of faith because it's God's church. Let's all stand to our feet. I want to pray over you real quick. If you'd like to, just raise your hands to the Lord. Some of you might be saying, well, I don't know about just raising our hands. Well, when I was a kid, we didn't have like cable. We had channel 56 and channel 38 in Boston. And my father would say, hey, get up. It's all staticky. Get up and grab the rabbit ears, put some aluminum foil on it and hold it over there to the left. Why did I have to do that? When you lift your hands to heaven, you're saying, God, I'm, I'm you, man. I've got my antennas up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release your heart in this house. Father, we only want one thing here. We want you to be glorified. God, we want you to know that this is a place that you can trust us with new babies. That this is a place we can raise new souls. That this is a place that will disciple them and grow them up in 
you, God. God, you can trust us with more people. You can trust us with more souls. Lord, burden us with people that don't know you as their Savior. Don't allow us, oh God, to get hard-hearted and religious-minded. But Jesus, move in our lives that we'll be driven to share the good news of Jesus with everybody we know. We want your heart to be stronger than ours. So Lord, I release that anointing in the name of Jesus and declare that this house is your house, your purposes, your design. And Lord, we will not step to the right hand or the left. We will not look behind, but God, we're going to keep our eyes focused on you. We're going to do your will no matter what. And your greatest will John 17, 3, and that you may know the Father and the Son whom he has sent. We want to know you, not just know about you. So we submit our hearts to you, Jesus. We submit our hearts to you. If you pray right out loud with me, Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation. Today, I'm telling you, from my heart, that I want you to be my number one priority. I lay everything else down. As Paul said, I'll count all things dung just to know you. I want to know you. So Holy Spirit, draw me. Convict me. Make me. Build me. Draw me. And use me. Then in these last days, I'll store up treasures in heaven and people will know that you are a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I love you. Bless your church. I declare God in Jesus' name that not one will be lost, but all will serve you all the rest of their lives. All the way to the fifth generation, I declare in the name of Jesus, there is no sickness, no disease, no maiming, no wounding, no growth, no spirits of infirmity, no elongated pain in Jesus' name. I rebuke it right now in their bodies. I rebuke God and declare that signs and wonders will follow the preaching of your word. I declare, God, we will prosper in all things and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. That God financially will be blessed, our families will be blessed, our souls will be whole, and that God will be ministers of your gospel for your honor and glory. And everybody receiving it said, the prayer.